Hello, I'm Christopher Keneally at the Frankfurt Book Fair with all the team from CCC. We're here in Hall 4, learning how a strategic commitment to data quality can impact the entire research ecosystem for funders, authors, institutions, and publishers. Welcome to the Data Quality Imperative, Improving the Scholarly Publishing Ecosystem. I'm Christopher Keneally with Copyright Clearance Center, and I host our podcast series, Velocity of Content. Thomas Redman, who goes by the Data Doc on Twitter, wrote in the Harvard Business Review that you can't do anything important in your company without high-quality data. Redman advises us to get data right from the get-go. This new approach and the changes needed to make it happen must be step one, he wrote, for any leader serious about cultivating a data-driven mindset across the company. In publishing, open access is transforming the scholarly journal. In the laboratory and at the university, open science is remaking research. For this new open environment, best practices with data are those that, are, that strive to be efficient, transparent, and fair. That is, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. My guests this afternoon will share their insights on the impact that a strategic commitment to data quality can have on the people, processes, and technology in your publishing organization, as well as the entire research system, including authors, libraries, research institutions, and funders. I want to introduce who we have to speak today. On the far end for me is Sabil Geisenheiner. Sabil, welcome. Sabil is Director of Open Science Strategy and Licensing for the American Chemical Society, one of the world's largest scientific organizations with membership of over 151,000 people in 140 countries. And uh, in the center here is my colleague, Laura Cox. Laura, welcome. Thank you. Laura is Senior Director of Publishing Industry Data for CCC. In May, CCC acquired Ringgold, a provider of persistent organization identifiers widely used by the scholarly communications industry. Laura Cox is a board member and treasurer of ISNI, an ISO standard and used by numerous libraries, publishers, databases, and rights management organizations around the world. And immediately to my right is Dr. Joe Haveman. Joe, welcome. Thanks. Joe is the founder and coordinating director at Africa Archive, the African Open Access Portal, with the mission to increase the discoverability of research achievements from and about Africa. Dr. Haveman holds a PhD in evolution and developmental biology and served in Nairobi, Kenya with the UN Environmental Program Climate Change Adaptation Unit. She's currently a trainer and consultant in open science communication and digital science project management for access to perspectives. And I'd like to turn first to Sibyl Geisenheiner. And, and when we're thinking about data uh, in the scholarly publishing ecosystem, research is first. But it seems that data is a very close second. And it's much more a part of the publisher's job than ever before. Yes, and I think uh, the big question mark is what does data mean in general? So you have research data, you have publishing data, and uh, a lot of data in the house as well. And uh, I think, at least from a publisher perspective, we, uh, well, some of us or many of us just realized yeah, in the last couple of years how much data we actually have and what we, uh, what we, can do with it and how we can approach customers, uh, if it is the researcher, the institution, or a funder, with, with the data we have in-house. Right, and, and it's really about creating a more efficient, more effective workflow, isn't it? So all those different touch points along the way from, from the submission to the publication and, and after that. Yes, I mean, as uh, yeah, scientific society, for us, the researcher is always in the center. The research, researcher as a reader, so as a consumer, or as an author, uh, like a producer, it's, uh, it's really in the center of what we are doing. And to create workflows for the researcher uh, to make it as easy as possible for him to either create content or consume content is really, yeah, simply a key thing to do. 
And in the world of transformative agreements, it's also about communication. You have to be able to work with the researcher as well, right? It's a two-way uh, process. Yes, absolutely. Um, those deals, and maybe some people have seen the, the presentation before about transformative agreements, those arrangements between institutions and publishers are getting more and more complex by adding like a publishing uh, uh, element uh, to a former reading or subscription uh, agreement. And this is really complex in, in, in what we are doing. It's, it starts by really, uh, yeah, when a, when a researcher submits an article to really see is that researcher covered or affiliated with a read and publish institution. So to really give him the right direction right from the beginning of the process, this is your way to go. Or if they are not in an agreement, if they have a certain funder, for example, with a certain mandate applied to really direct him through the right spot in the system, this is the way for you to be compliant with your mandate and uh, this is the right way to check out of the system when your article is accepted. And for that you really need big data resources. Right, and, and the obligation is on the publisher to collect all this data, but there's also an obligation for the researcher too to be sure from the, from the get-go that they are delivering the right kind of information. It will have an impact on, on, on their work, but it will also have an impact on their audience. Yes, absolutely. This is why you need standardized uh, registries like Ringel, for example, where, where people have no out of a list of institutions, this is mine, this is the one. I need to, to pick <laughs> to, to yeah, be recognized as affiliated with that institution and not free flow and put something in which really ends up uh, with, a, with the list of different name variations. And, and so to, to have those implemented, those yeah, quality checkpoints more or less, um, right from the beginning is really key. Right, and, and so it's important to the researcher, to the reader, but it's also important to ACS because you are watching this data, it's informing you about these agreements, how well they're working, whether they're achieving the objectives that they have. You need to have high quality data at that side too because it's going to matter in negotiations and the way you plan for, for future agreements. Yeah, absolutely, and for example, uh, the most recent deal we did, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the second quarter of this year with the uh, California consortia, it's three consortia actually combining. There is not just to capture the, the, the correct data, it's also triggering the right communication because it is a complete different setting of having uh, yeah, possible funder involvement uh, and, and all that. And to combine all this, you need really ha to have systems who are capable mm. and agile enough, more or less, to really uh, yeah, have that fine-tuning on the individual situation of an agreement. Because this is definitely something we learned over the last yeah, couple of years, that all these de deals, read or read and publish agreements, have a different flavor from one to the other. But this is something the researcher shouldn't worry about. They should have the same author experience coming through the system, knowing that in the background people take care, that they are really doing the right thing at the right moment. All right. To, to your point about the, the, the variety of transformative agreements, I'm, I'm fond of saying that um, transformative agreements are, are, are like marriages and snowflakes. There are no two alike. Yeah, no. So, so for ACS, that's a real challenge. Yeah, not just for us. I think that's for everyone, and it's also from from a, from an institution perspective. They have ten agreements and with ten publishers, and all of them have different variations. And and so, also that data to keep track of that. Uh, um, what am I allowed with this agreement, or what is the demand from that agreement? This is also from 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 all perspectives, from a publisher perspective, but as well from an institutional perspective, key. Uh, and Sibyl Geisenheiner, finally, about um, the, the, the real interest that we have more than ever to um, make uh, the research ecosystem a, a global ecosystem, truly a global one, and be able to include researchers and communities from all parts of the world. Does, does high quality data play a role in, in ACS's interactions with 
uh, the various regions of, of the planet? Yeah. I mean, that's uh, from from what we can uh, read out of the agreements we have in place, that is absolutely key, and we would want to include and not exclude. That's right. really uh, um, yeah something we, we are looking for. That's not always possible, but that's definitely something we're trying to do. And, and to have really the funder involvement there much more on the front allows us to be much more yeah, global in a way, because funders act global. They, in, in many ways, not just fund in a certain country. I mean, uh, yeah, research is a, is a global endeavor, so you have a lot of different uh, authors on a paper from very different institutions f from all parts of the globe, and, and uh, to make them, yeah, to enable them to, to be compliant with all they are asked for is really key, and this is why we need those data, this is why we need those connections, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a constantly evolving environment. All right. Well, Sabil Geisenheiner with ACS, thank you. And, and I want to turn to uh, my colleague Laura Cox at, at CCC. And, you know, CCC has a longstanding interest in, in quality data. It's important to our rights licensing programs as, as well as RightsLink, our open access solution. So does the acquisition of Ringgold uh, signal that CCC believes this issue of data quality is really more important than, than ever? Absolutely. I mean, we're moving into, as Sabil says quite rightly, into a much more complex environment as the, we gradually transition to open access and open science. Um, and so the, the issues around data, um, the quality of the data, the accuracy of the data, the, the, the ability to link data becomes more and more important. So as we're moving into reading published deals, as Sabil says, both sides of the negotiation need to have the right data. Um, the publisher needs to know which um, components of an institution are included in the read part as existing licensees and which um, are you know, publishing open access, possibly through an APC model, and who's paying for that APC? Because if it's the funder paying, then it, should it be part of the, the cons construct for the library? And there'll be a conversation about that. So actually understanding you know, who the author is with a persistent ID like an ORCID or an ISNI, where they're affiliated in the hierarchy of an institution to know whether it's included in any transformative deal um, with a Ringgold ID or a, a RAW or an ISNI is really important. And then you know, we're tying all that, that information together to produce um, the, the transformative deals that, that further this effort to move to open access, which everyone's behind. Um, but we also need some of the data to start being uh, the less burden on the researcher um, because they're still having to input a lot of this information and it's still difficult. And it really needs to start earlier in the process, in the, you know, in the funding process, in the grant application process, and for persistent IDs particularly to flow with that through it downstream and, and throughout the, the, the cycle and, and then you can pull back to analytics. Yeah, and so so talk, uh, Laura Cox, about the role that that high quality data can play in, in facilitating collaboration. Because as you say, the farther up the stream we move to, to really the very beginning of the process, really means that relationships become, uh, I would imagine, uh, more fluid, right? And so that's going to create opportunities for collaboration. Well, there's all sorts of opportunities in different settings as well. So it's, it's collaborative, but it's also it's improvement of efficiencies. Um, so it, there's, a, there's a European national funder um, who have integrated persistent IDs of all flavors into their national curriculum system, their CV CRIS system, their CRIS system, and then filter that down to the local institutions' CRIS systems. And it's, it's saved 90,000 hours of administration across that country a year in research. And that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and then that data, if it filters through to the publisher, saves a lot of the pain points where, we, um, where we're experiencing data, you know, missing it because of some kind of piece of workflow where it's not passed through um, or, or where there's something has been, you know, mis misused, put in the wrong place. Um, and then data is having to be rebuilt. So we're having to add the persistent IDs back into the system, which really should just flow through continuously throughout the life cycle. Yeah. And, and publishers with these various agreements, they're, they're under pressure. Yes. Because... 
Um, the funders are expecting compliance. They're expecting Absolutely. compliance from the authors, from the researchers, but that responsibility does sort of bleed into the publishing world. It, it does, and, and it's complicated because um, funders have ver a variety of mandates. Um, they use different terminology and language to mean similar things in their mandates. Um, we haven't got any standards set around how we communicate that through into systems um, to enable authors to make the right choices about their, the journal that they're selecting or um, in the cases where they have multiple funding sources, those funding mandates can, can actually be quite different and occasionally conf uh, conflict. So actually passing more information into the ex user experience of the system to enable um, researchers to, to, to select journals, to ensure that they're you know, following the mandate, um, and for all of that information to then go back to the funder to say, yep, this is all where you wanted it, and the data set is posted, and we have you know, the protocols and all of the other pieces. Right, and, and you mentioned the case of the European uh, University uh, Consortium or organization, and and the and the achievement of saving ninety thousand hours of, of of what could be research time or time better mm -hmm. spent otherwise at the university. But this also has a, a commercial benefit as well. And Sabil's mentioned some of that. But but tell us a little bit more about the role that quality data plays in this ambition to have organizations be be, be data driven and to be making decisions around data. So I mean. You've described to me anyway, Chris, in the past as, as data as being a bit blurry. Um, and so we add metadata to it. So we, just, we, we have descriptions of that data. And then when we add persistent IDs, we bring it into focus. And those persistent IDs are interoperable. And that's the key word, is that we're, we're creating something that is a permanent piece of information that can be linked from one thing to another. So we can look at collaborations, how often does author A collaborate with, with author B and which institutions that and what are they working on and who's funding them. This is all information that plays back into the system and drives decision, it, it enables decision making rather than um, you know, things being slightly obfuscated. Right, and, and finally Laura Cox, the, 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 the publishing uh, uh, ecosystem, the word I'm fond of using today, is less and less focused only on the journal or the journal article. It's, a, it's interested in all sorts of parts of the research life cycle. And does quality data matter there as well? Yes. I think it's all part of the same process. And we really need to start with, you know, we've got the grant applications, we've got the process that we're going through, we're, we're undertaking research, we're creating data sets, we have methodology, where we're generating preprints, um, then there's the you know, submission processes, there are, there's access to those articles, there's usage, the citation, and, um, and ultimately analytics that help us understand impact. And whether, you know, we're meeting diversity and inclusion goals or sustainable development goals and, and look at those sorts of things that genuinely benefit society throughout the system. Oh, that's an important point, isn't it? Impact. That's what funders want to know. That's what the researchers want to know. Everybody involved really wants to know what difference they're making, right? L Laura Cox, thank you. And I want to turn finally to, to Joe Haveman and tell us about Africa Archive and particularly how data really matters in this, in this uh, uh, objective you have to uh, bring African research and African researchers to the world. Yeah, thanks so much. I want to acknowledge also all my colleagues in Africa who cannot be here with us today. Um, first and foremost, also Joy Wango, who is a dear colleague and also partner institution to Africa Archive, which is also our umbrella um, organization, the Training Center for Communication in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, so Africa Archive was founded in 2018 to increase discoverability of African research output. Because um, what we see in the digital indexing databases is only what's discoverable through the persistent identifiers and algorithms that have been built in a Western context. And that's historically explainable and nothing to criticize. History has played how it's played. Um, and now our approach is, okay, what infrastructure exists that can also be utilized by researchers from around the world because it has a global mandate, as you also said, the um, uh, chemical society has. So um, 
our idea was to initiate to use existing infrastructure to encourage African scholars to disseminate their work as preprints, postprints, whatever research they output they have, data sets, anything they can um, share. Um, have a DOI assigned, like the first persistent identifier, then preferably also sign up with their ORCID ID, the other one, and also have an uh, institution affiliation identifier. Now you've partnered with Ringor, there's also RR. There's some complementary aspects between the two. So the idea with the, there's also other um, like researcher identifiers other than ORCID and they all have their reason for existence and can complement complement each other nicely. So by using these identifiers and infrastructures and technology behind, we saw a chance, and that's also nicely playing out now in its fifth year, <laughs> how we can um, boost like almost overnight uh, um, the discoverability of, in our case, African um, research output and thereby change the narrative from, oh, what we see might only be less than 0.1%, but it's actually more, because a lot is still in print, a lot is not discoverable because it's sitting on institutional repositories without internet connection, without the persistent identifiers and other standards to make it discoverable to the international databases and algorithms. So this is basically where we are plugging in to May to, to acknowledge and build on the existing infrastructure in the region to um, map, like we've done a mapping exercise over like two years, which is continuously growing to map what research output is being archived, where in the world and where across the continent, how, how discoverable is it already to our well-known and not so well-known discovery databases. Um, so there's also a variety thereof, not, not only the usual suspect go-to references. Um, so yeah, we, we're informing about all of that really and talking to all kinds of stakeholders on the continent, internationally, like also Africa is international with 40, 54 countries, um, but also on a global scale to see what we can learn from other world regions. In Latin America, there's a huge open access experience over many decades. They basically pivoted and piloted and pioneered the whole open access movement ever since, I think, the past 30 years or so or longer, and are now also kind of experiencing the same challenges of everywhere else. But, but I think we're on a good pathway here. and. Um, that I also want to acknowledge what you said, like I, I appreciate what you said in terms of it has to be simple and easy for the researcher because they are there to do research and not have to boggle around with all kinds of technologies and of course they're also responsible to add the content specific metadata and that's what I'm also teaching with access to perspectives. Um, data management, research project management, fair data, care data, also considering things like um, who's responsible, who, um, who owns the data before, during and after the project, who's responsible for maintenance and to, to inform the data set with the required metadata. But I should maybe take right. a break here. And, and, and Joe so we, we've been hearing from the others about the importance of impact. And you tell that story and I have to imagine that it's kind of having a tremendous impact for the African researchers themselves, for the institutions, Tell us a bit on the ground, what's it like for them to, to have this resource and to use and to have that resource to then become part of other resources, other databases? Well, um, what I said in the past two minutes sounds really exciting. And you're thinking that like, we thought, oh, this is easy to adopt as a concept. Turns out there's a lot of reservation when it comes to preprints, postprints, sharing your research output anywhere else than a peer reviewed publisher or journal. Um, and that's an experience we are not only making in, across Africa, but the whole researcher community has that um, reservation. And uh, I can only tell you, as we also said before, um, you and I, when we spoke, preprints are here to stay and they're being established as part of the publishing workflow as we speak. The publishers are already on it. The publishers, sorry. And the funders are already demanding it, like increasingly so. Um, it's, it's just that people like myself and Joy with the training center, like what's missing or what we need more of to inform also now the practicing researchers of the opportunities that preprint publishing and, and following a preprint substantiated community-based peer review and then also like editorial through journal publishing and layouting and typesetting 
And curation, I think that's the most important um, task for, for the journalism and publishing industry. The curation of the masses of data that, that, that are being produced across all disciplines now, like we've never seen so much and that needs to be curated. Right, and I think maybe a good way to end is, is on that very point about the, the as we evolve, it, we are seeing many more relationships created, there's a sort of interrelationships become more important, interdisciplinary research becomes more important. Is, is, is that how you see it? Totally. I mean, Africa Archive is interdisciplinary by its nature because we chose the focus on the region, like regional focus, um, and it enables interdisciplinary research. Um, also, um, cross-regional, we're also multilingual. Um, by nature, we accept um, submissions from any language of the world, and that's also Thankfully, we observe a lot of many publishers also adopt that concept to make um, not only interdisciplinary but also breaking the language barriers mm -hmm. in many ways and very efficiently so. Um, and much of that can be seen here in the third, second floor. <laughs> um, if you if you come and join us in the um, scientific publishing level, um, so many many publishers and service providers are facilitating that. And yes, it's it's crucial for impact. And when we talk about impact, there's unfortunately a misconception for a high impact vector journal um, effect. Sorry. Um, yeah. So the, the, the impact, impact factor. factor is for the journals right. is not what we, uh, I think also what, not what you were referring to, but what societal impact can yes. research actually have? Like why are we doing research in the first place? Yes, to acquire knowledge, but then what? We have urgent challenges to solve here. And research has all the answers and we just need to make sense of the results that the researchers have generated where we come back to the persistent identifiers and the curation. And yeah. so we're on a good path, I would say. All right, well, Joe Hoffman, thank you for that background in Africa Archive. Well, we learned a lot. And I appreciate uh, the contributions of my panel. So Bill Geisenheiner with American Chemical Society, Laura Cox with CCC, Joe Haberman with uh, Africa Archive and uh, Access to Perspectives. And um, I appreciate you joining us today. I'll mention that a Nobel laureate once said that if you torture your data long enough, it'll tell you anything. But my advice is that treat your data well, it will return the favor. All right. <laughs> My name is Chris Canelli with CCC. Thanks for being here.